Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Julie Mayshek, Director of Global Programs in the 92nd Street Wise Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's conversation is part of a new initiative from the 92nd Street Y called Campaign for 100%. Between now and Election Day, we're bringing you a series of virtual events that explore what changes when more people vote and participate in democracy. Please visit 92y.org forward slash campaign for 100 to learn more. And a very special thank you to Cynthia Giwa and our co-presenters tonight at ProPublica for making this event possible. We encourage you to visit ProPublica.org, sign up for the User's Guide to Democracy, and also check out Election Land, which monitors problems that prevent people from voting. If you have trouble voting or witness any problems, you can report via text, WhatsApp, or Facebook. A quick note that we are taking questions this evening. Regardless of what platform you're watching on, you can put your questions in the chat or comment section and they will get to us and to our panel. And it's a real pleasure again to welcome you to this incredibly timely conversation on the threat of misinformation and our stellar panel of guests. We are joined this evening by Amy Cohen, the Executive Director of the National Association of State Election Directors, Dr. Claire Wardol, a leading expert on user-generated content verification and misinformation. She is co-founder and executive director of First Draft, the world's foremost nonprofit focused on research and practice to address mis- and disinformation. We're also joined by Jeff Gao, a computational journalist at ProPublica who uses data science to cover technology and disinformation. Our moderator this evening is Wyatt Sinak, stand-up comedian, writer, and producer. You know him from his work on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, where he earned three Emmys and one Writers Guild Award. And he starred in his own satirical docu-series for HBO, Wyatt Cenac's Problem Areas. The first season can now be streamed for free on YouTube. And with that, I'll throw it to you, Wyatt. Thank you, Julie. And uh, just to clear up some misinformation there, actually both seasons are available for free on YouTube. Um, <laughs> So look at that. We've solved it, everybody. That was, I just defined misinformation, and it's all about my show existing on YouTube. Um, now, again, thanks to the 92nd Street Y and to ProPublica for sponsoring this event. I think maybe the first thing to kind of get into is in this moment when we talk about misinformation and disinformation and, you know, trying to get a sense of what that looks like. It, it, that feels like, those feel like broad terms and it feels like something that could refer to Russians who are deliberately sharing false information to meddle in a US election. And when I say Russians, I, I should say Russian actors uh, on behalf of the government um, or just like an aunt who's just sending you a meme on Facebook. It, it feels like there is a broad uh, definition of what misinformation and disinformation is. So I was wondering to the panelists if you all might be able to kind of help decipher what that is. Should I be reporting my aunt to the government for sending false information via Facebook meme? Um, and yeah, just what, help us kind of navigate that. Yeah, so you shouldn't report her, but you shouldn't mute her. You don't so know her. <laughs> don't know. We, have, we have a problem I think that we mute the high school friends and we mute our uncles when they're sharing information we don't like and actually as society we should be having a conversation with each other about what this information is doing to our societies but just very quickly you just kind of explained it disinformation is false information that's being shared by people who know it's false and they're deliberately trying to cause harm which is different to your aunt who's basically sharing false or misleading content but she doesn't know it's false and she doesn't mean any harm by it and the reason it's important to think about those two distinctions is what we might do to stop Russian meddling is there'd be a different intervention with your auntie. So I think that's why it's important to think about those two things differently. I mean, I don't know. I feel like throw the book at my aunt. Um, <laughs> she should know better. She's not here to defend herself, becoming a big fan of your aunt. <laughs> you don't know her, um, <laughs> this imaginary aunt of mine. <laughs> um, but thinking about that, thinking about misinformation, specifically thinking about those aunts or, you know, you see it when celebrities will sometimes tweet things uh, and use social media and they have huge followings. I guess that raises the question of how big of a threat 
does something like misinformation pose to this election? From the election official standpoint, uh, it's all the same, right? Whether it's misinformation or disinformation. And I'm glad that you highlighted um, celebrities and influencers, people with really big followings, because what we see is that they're very well-meaning, they want to help, they want to get good information out there. And um, when they share inaccurate information, they're doing it at with such an extreme megaphone um, that it can have huge impacts. Um, we've seen, you know, in Kentucky, which is a, a great example in the primary, um, there was one tweet that said there were uh, that all the voters in in Jefferson County, six hundred thousand voters, were voting at one polling place, um, and that went hugely viral. And uh, the result was that um, the state election office and the local election office received so many calls and emails from out of state that they actually couldn't help their own voters. And so, uh, people with large platforms need to sort of think through the impacts of sharing that kind of information because the downstream effects can be pretty significant. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's also important to note that, you know, uh, even if information is true, uh, it, sometimes it can be damaging as well. Um, I think, you know, we saw this in 2016 when, you know, John Podesta's emails were hacked and leaked on the internet for, you know, everyone to see um, uh, and sort of change the conversation. Um, and so I think, you know, if I remember correctly, I think Claire has like a definition for sort of this other type of you know information uh, problem as well. Um, and uh, you know, I think in many ways, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be wrong, but it's if it's aimed at sort of changing uh, the conversation or um, sort of whitewashing, uh, you know, a certain problematic aspect uh, of information. Uh, for example, you know, there's also. Uh, online propaganda that you know nation states do to sort of burnish their image online. Um, I think th these are all sort of like different ways uh, that information can be manipulated uh, to suit a certain party. Yeah, and, and just to back that up, actually, a lot of what we see is genuine content, but used out of context. It's got a kernel of truth to it. I mean, why are you going to try and fabricate something from scratch when you can, you know, try something you that is already out there? And um, the computers, the computational moderation processes will be like, oh, that's genuine. So that could be a much more effective tactic. Something that Jeff was saying about kind of like the deluge of information, I never really thought about that as like misinformation. I, it feels like at a time right now where thanks to social media, you know, you can kind of get a news story every hour that that idea that you can shift the conversation by just kind of continuing to pump out stories. I, I never really, it, it's an, that's an interesting thing. I never really thought of that. I feel like so often I think of something like misinformation as, like you said, so, uh, Claire's somebody takes a kernel of truth, but then sort of warps it and distorts it in this way and not really thinking about, oh yeah, just a sort of overtaxed news cycle can also help to make things, uh, you know, help st the important stories get lost and the conversation shift into something totally different. Yeah. Um, I guess with that in mind, thinking about that, you know, we talked about sort of the role that celebrities and people with large followings, like individuals with large followings can have on social media. But I also wonder about online communities and how online communities, uh, what role they may play in spreading misinformation, whether that's, uh, you know, an online community on Facebook or just Facebook itself or Reddit or just how like those communities, uh, how they play in that sort of misinformation. Uh, I don't want to call it a game because it's not a game. It's uh, something terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this is such an important point in that we, those of us who think about quality information often think as broadcasters, either one Twitter account or Facebook page or a TV account, but the audience is networked. And actually in the last couple of years in particular, there's been this pivot to privacy, which Mark Zuckerberg talks about, but that was because he, re he recognized that people were spending more time in closed groups or in WhatsApp spaces, 
people want to be with smaller groups of people who they trust. But what that means is that this misinformation can spread in these groups that we don't know about. So from an election official perspective, you know, we're worried at first draft about rumors that could circulate amongst, for example, Latinx communities that are targeted trying to suppress the vote. But that might be happening in WhatsApp groups that we would never be able to see that content. So that's the challenge here, which is the audience is networked and the information moves like that. But over here, we're like, oh, this is how we do it, like broadcasters. But that's right. not how the audience thinks about information. We also try to focus less on the number of followers because anyone with two followers is sharing that information with someone who can then share it with someone. Um, and to Claire's point, the sort of networked model that uh, the internet uh, gives us means that it doesn't matter if you have five followers or five million followers, it is as important to get the information corrected because you have no idea how it's going to spread and morph over time. Yeah. Um, I wonder, I mean, obviously we're talking about this idea of misinformation and disinformation as it relates to you know, a world where thanks to social media, this information is so much easier to get and to get from sources all over the place. But I'm curious, in you all's opinion, do you feel this level of misinformation is new or is it simply different from the kinds of misinformation or lack of information that we had in the past? And I, I say that just thinking about how you were talking about people can kind of silo themselves in these little online communities and I guess when I think back to a time before the internet and even before the sort of, you know, TV being as kind of readily available as it was, you had people in small communities who maybe got their version of the news that wasn't necessarily what the national version, thinking about like, you know, you look at Birmingham in 1963 and how the Birmingham newspaper covered civil unrest in Birmingham versus how, you know, the New York Times covered it. And just just curious with that in mind, yeah, is this is this a, a different level of misinformation or it's just a it's just a different structure that we're playing with now? Yeah, um, I think it, it's definitely a different structure. Um, and I think uh, in many ways it's actually uh, sort of um, more pernicious, I guess, you know, so, sorry, that's not sort of an optimistic take, but um, I think, you know, social media viewing experiences are very private, right? No one really knows, uh, you know, sort of experiences what someone else experiences and it's all sort of optimized to engage you in a certain way. And, you know, what that means is it's it's not necessarily sort of the true information that rises to the top, it's the, the catchy or viral information, um, you know, whether it's true or not, whether it's safe or not. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, the role of communities uh, really plays a big role in that, too. I think, you know, um, uh, for example, Facebook over the last few years has really prioritized, you know, groups and communities, um, partly because, you know, privacy, I guess, but also partly because they, they find that it engages people a lot more, right? Um, uh, but, you know, instead of Birmingham, where, you know, your community is sort of the people you trust and, and you know, live nearby, your family, your close friends, um, you know, these people are, you know, they might be, you know, people with similar views, you know, these uh, <laughs> sort of conspiratorial or mi minority views from across the internet. Um, and uh, I, I don't think as a society, we, we sort of like, sort of figured out, you know, how to deal with it, right? Like, I, I don't, I don't know if we should be sort of policing people's thoughts, but it's also, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the different structure of it uh, sort of allows these communities to arise. Uh, and uh, organize around these these sort of very minority issues. Yeah, and I think just going back to as humans, we connect with people through gossip and rumor. Somebody once said like apes connect with each other by picking ticks off each other. We don't have that as humans because we don't have fur. So we have gossip instead. But I think, you know, we have always gossip. There's always been rumor, but to, to Jeff's point, it's the scale. So you could have a rumor circulate in your small village but what it means now is that this can, the scale, the amount of it is something that we've never seen before and the scale at which it can travel um, is different. And, and the micro-targeting and, and how people have their very personalized experience of this, that's, that's what's different. The yeah. ability to travel is I think an important point um, because for elections, 
misinformation has been around since the beginning of elections. Um, you know, there have always been, you know, this party votes on Tuesday, this party votes on Wednesday kinds of things since basically the beginning of our democracy. What's different now is that that doesn't stay isolated to one town or one state or one community. It's going nationwide. And so even if something might be true in one place, the way that information spreads now means that the scale of it is just a completely different animal. Um, there's a question from a viewer that I feel like sort of gets to some of this as it relates to being responsible in an online community. And the question uh, this viewer asks is, they would really love to know how to be more discerning on Facebook and also how to manipulate their news feeds to avoid the bots. Is that even something that's possible? They may also be asking if someone can help them because they've lost their password. So <laughs> any of those answers. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I'd say is there's you know lots of great media literacy tools out there, which is how you can use tools to check things out. But the one thing I think everybody has to be more aware of is, is developing emotional skepticism. So whether you're from the left or the right, whether you are incredibly well educated or less, all of us are susceptible to this. And I think what we have to learn is if we see something and it makes you feel something, it makes you angry, it makes you scared, it makes you want to go and buy something immediately on Amazon Prime, like that your emotions are being manipulated in order to have a reaction. And when that happens, our brains, which are already slightly lizardish, like just stop working and we're unable to use the critical skills that we have been taught in media literacy classes. So the one thing we have to recognize when we're on Facebook scrolling through is A, try and follow feeds from people that you know and trust and who do put out quality information. And if there's something that you don't recognize the name of that source, um, really think about who might be behind that and why they're sharing it and think about how it's making you feel. And I think we have to have more conversations with each other about emotional skepticism rather than Oh, always Google the headline. I mean, right. whatever. like that's the bigger problem. For election information, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get your information from state and local election officials. Um, this is always really important, but especially this year when things are very different. Uh, most of us are going to vote in a very different way than we have in the past as a result of COVID. And so things are changing very quickly. Um, much to the dismay of many of my members, things are changing very last minute. Um, and so it's so important to get your information from state and local election officials so that you know that you can trust the information. Something we see a lot is that groups create graphics with deadlines or how to do this or how to do that. And those might be correct when they create them, but that was two weeks ago or that was 12 hours ago and things have really changed. And so especially when you're seeing election information uh, on, on social platforms and really anywhere, think critically about where it's coming from and go to the source, which is your state or local election official. Um, yeah, that's, I, some, as you were talking about that, I was just reminded of uh, something that I was told uh, by a veteran who had been working in, uh, on veterans issues and how veterans often get targeted with like, websites that are made to look intentionally bad like they were just quickly made government websites uh, and how they often get like targeted in these ways where they don't they maybe didn't fill the search bar out correctly and they're kind of in the wrong place and so in trying to it, it becomes a challenge trying to sort of discern, okay, what's real and what's not. And I guess, and this this is maybe a bigger, broader question, but is there a responsibility that, or, you know, is there a responsibility that some of these social media platforms and online service providers should be taking to kind of help this? I, I, Claire, you kind of mentioned this idea of like, you know, should you Google every headline? And it feels a little strange that there is just kind of like this open floor of good information, bad information, and 
Yeah, I wonder is there is there more that these companies could be doing to kind of help regulate some of that misinformation that is out there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's, de I mean, there's definitely a lot more. And I think in the last year, they've started to do a little bit more, right? Like, uh, you know, Twitter labeling, you know, certain problematic uh, tweets or, you know, Facebook, you know, labeling certain problematic posts or content. It's definitely not enough. Um, I think, you know, often when people with, um, particular motivation, see something that they would be inclined to agree with, you know, the label doesn't matter, right? And they'll continue to propagate it. Um, um, I think, uh, again, you know, I think these platforms benefit a lot from sort of the engagement that they're getting. Um, and, you know, they're making money on these ads. And, um, you know, the side effect of that is I think people are <laughs> getting fed bad information and um, they do have to, um, take steps to limit the spread of uh, bad information. Um, you know, it, it's it. It's not even sort of like censorship. It's really about you know, uh, do do these pieces of bad information, um, uh, do they deserve the same amplification um, as you know uh, other sort of more benign content? Yeah, I mean, it it feels in some ways it's like well, if you put cigarettes next to you know, vitamins on a shelf and didn't tell anybody, okay, these two things don't provide the same kind of outcome and just let people decide. Like that's like, there's a reason that we have labels in the real world. There's a reason we have regulation. Um, and so it does feel, uh, it does feel weird that there isn't more regulation happening in that way. Um, I wanna go to Claire for a minute because just even as we're talking about this, you and the team at First Draft are experts who are highly trained at social news gathering and verification. I'm just wondering outside of, yeah, Googling every headline, are there some strategies? I know you talked about, uh, you know, sort of looking for trusted sources, but are there other strategies uh, that you might suggest for ways people can uh, identify misinformation online. I know that we've got a few examples that we were maybe going to pull up to kind of help uh, help illustrate that. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing I'd say is um, be aware that a lot of the most effective content is visual media. So be very aware of those memes that your aunt sends you. I mean, be very aware of the, the, the an image or even a profile picture. So if you haven't ever tried a reverse image search on Google, if you search Google Images, you get a little camera icon and it allows you to upload an image and it will tell you whether that image has appeared anywhere else on the web. So sometimes if you see a profile picture of a devastatingly handsome man, you might then do a reverse image search and it's a stock photo of devastatingly handsome man on a bicycle or whatever it is. And so it makes you realize that that's probably not the person in the Twitter account that they've taken this stock image. Or, or if you see, for example, uh, crowds of protesters put it into Google reverse image search, it might actually be from 2016. It's not from Kentucky on this, you know, on this day. So right. that, those kind of things are really easy. And things like websites, uh, using a tool like who.is, who is, will allow you to see when was the website set up. If it was only registered two weeks ago, I'm going to be a lot more worried about it than if it's been around for 17 years. So there's a few of those kind of tricks and tools that um, anybody could use. They're all free to use. But again, the, the biggest thing is just um, to be skeptical of content that makes you have those feelings again. Well, with that in mind, there is, uh, I think we have an image from Twitter uh, that someone had uh, posted. I wonder if we can maybe go to that slide um, and then we can also go to the others, but uh, there was one from Twitter, uh, not that one, we, if we can, uh, yeah. yes. So, so here's an example actually of a genuine photograph. So this circulated on in August and you can see from the engagement numbers, it got huge traffic because this is when obviously many conversations about the postal service and was it prepared. And so this photo started circulating and everybody was very concerned about it. We actually did some digging at First Draft and found that this was actually a center that refurbishes mailboxes. And we found the kind of the schedule schedule of when it was when they were going to repaint these boxes. And there was nothing malicious about this. But if you are from a position when you're worried about the postal service in this moment, this visual makes you have that emotional connection and you want to share and say, I told you so. 
and, and so in that context, this is not a false image, but and there wasn't an easy way to do this other than we did a reverse image search. It, it didn't appear anywhere else. We did some digging, we geolocated where that center was, we called the center and we just did journalism around it. Um, but that this is a good example to say, again, and this was people on the left that were really sharing this. Um, we have to, this affects people on all sides of the, well, both sides of the spectrum. Right, and I think yeah. with that in mind, there's another tweet, uh, if we can go to the, the next slide, um, I think this is what you're talking about, about the model thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's devastatingly attractive. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an example of people taking stock imagery. I mean, we also need to be wary now. We're seeing more AI generated profile pictures, artificial intelligence that creates pictures of people who don't exist at all. So if you do a reverse image search, it doesn't show up because it's being generated by a computer. But here's an example of basically they created a number of tweets that looked like accounts of black Americans basically saying, I'm no longer, I was Democrat and now I'm becoming a Republican. Um, we know that black and Latinx communities, communities of color are disproportionately targeted with disinformation campaigns. And this was an example of this, which is again, huge engagement because it resonated with people who wanted to believe that this was happening, that Democrats were shifting their vote over to Republicans. So again, this isn't necessarily, nobody's gonna check whether this is true or, or false. It resonates because it supports an existing worldview. And that's the problem with all of this, which is it's less about convincing people or changing people's minds. It's about strengthening their existing positions and making them feel connected to a community of people who feel the same as them. I think, Knowing, oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, I think the, the point that Claire made about how this impacts both sides of the aisle is incredibly important. Um, because just from conversations with my own network, it's there's this idea that one side, uh, you know, one side is responsible for the the misinformation that's out there. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's it's coming from everywhere, and it all of them, everyone is using a variety of different tactics, right? So it's not just the internet; it's text messaging, it's snail mail. You know, we've we've TikTok. recently, yeah, it's 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 everywhere. Um, and so it's an important thing to um, remember is that not only is it not just Democrats are doing it or Republicans are doing it, but it's also not just online, it's everywhere. Well, and with that, there's a question from Adam uh, for you, Amy. Uh, and he asks, how aggressively should local governments, election departments combat misinformation? It's really hard. Um, and state and local election officials are doing their best this year, um, given the circumstances. So we're seeing a lot more investment in voter education um, across the country at, at both the state level and at the local level. Um, if you're not familiar, um, the there are obviously 50 states in DC, but then there are between eight and 10,000 local election jurisdictions who are sort of the boots on the ground of elections. And so it's not just about information uh, campaign, proactive information campaigns coming out of the states, it's um, local election officials getting in on it too. And we're seeing just a lot more of that in an effort to sort of pre-bunk uh, rumors. And we're seeing a lot more um, distribution of FAQs um, and uh, more aggressive, um, you know, media, earned media and, and paid media. Uh, the challenge is, is that it takes a really sort of special person uh, and it's mostly me to know who their local election official is and to know who their state election official is. And so there's uh, a lot of, I think, responsibility on uh, members of the media also to amplify good information from state and local election officials to get this, act, this uh, good trusted information out there. Um, but this is something that uh, election officials are spending a lot of time on this year and a lot of money on as well. Um, Jeff, here's a question for Jonathan, um, or from Jonathan, uh, who asks, misinformation and negative news seem to go hand in hand. Do you see solutions, uh, aka constructive or positive journalism as part of the solution? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, news you can use uh, is always uh, helpful for people, right? Particularly around election time. I, I, I think, uh, you know, um, even the most in, like politically aware people, you know, the, the, the rules for like getting registered, if you've moved, 
et cetera, et cetera, it can get sort of uh, bewildering, right? Uh, it's, you know, and it's like, sort of like doing your taxes, right? You know, you got to do it. And then, you know, you sort of leave it to the last minute. And, uh, you know, particularly with COVID and, and uh, um, you know, these mail delays, uh, you know, I think um, people might sort of get sort of caught by surprise at the last minute. So I think that's very important. I think, um, you know, telling people how they can uh, participate in the electoral process is important. Um, you know, work that helps uh, helps folks sort of debunk uh, misinformation in their lives um, is really useful as well. And I think there's, you know, th there's been a lot more, you know, fact checking, um, sort of debunking of internet uh, misinformation uh, this year, right? Uh, we've, we've seen many projects, uh, you know, New York Times uh, has one, you know, First Draft has a really great one. It's, uh, I think mostly, uh, resource for journalists because, you know, who, who really wants to be looking at, uh, you know, this is fake, this is fake, <laughs> sort of a list of fake things all the time. But um, so I, th I think, you know, that that's all that's all quite helpful. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I would say at ProPublica, we, try, you know, we try to find bad guys, right? Like, that's, that's sort of our job. But I think, um, you know, solutions journalism and, and helping people, um, you know, exercise the right to vote, I think is, is really important uh, this year. Yeah, if I can just jump in with an example. Back in February, we were doing some training with a newsroom that will not be named. And somebody said, oh, this reminds me, you know, when you go to vote sometimes on a machine and you click a candidate's name and it flips to the other candidate. And I was like, oh, yeah, it happens every year. You know, there's always a video about it and it's a big deal. He was like, well, we've you know done some investigating. And in a lot of places, it's because the machines are old and the glue was dried. And so you have to recalibrate the machines. And I was like, oh, that would be such a great piece for you to do now. So over the next eight months, it rises up the Google search results. So when it does inevitably happen, people will find it. And he's like, oh, no, 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 we're just going to sit on this until it happens on election day. And then we'll put out the reporting. And I think that that goes to what we're saying here, which is lots of journalists feel uncomfortable about doing things that seem overtly helpful in that way. It needs to be a news story connected to an event. And I just think in, you know, in this world where people rely on Google, we have data voids, this concept of if there isn't quality information, that's when you see just the rumor. We should have like filled the internet with all of these rebunks, as Amy said, she's absolutely right. There's a ton of rumors that we know are going to come the wrong day. There's going to be ballot, pictures of ballot boxes in places we wouldn't expect. I mean, it's not rocket science. And what we should have been done a better job over the last few months is loading up the internet with like, you're, you've seen it, you're going to see it, be prepared for it. This is why you're seeing it. Take care and talk to your auntie about it. Yeah, I mean, election officials have been trying, but to Claire's point, we, we often can't get uh, the media to write about it until something happens. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've seen at the state level and even at the national level, we've done sort of um, either background or off the record briefings with reporters to explain the kinds of things that happen. Right. So inexplicably, every election day, cars drive into polling places. We don't know why. It just it happens every year and it's very normal to us. And we're just like, oh, that happened again. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, like trying to explain. To explain to um, you know at the national level, the national press, and at, at the state level, these are the normal things, right? Sometimes machines get out of calibration. Um, you know, ballots swell; they're very sensitive to humidity, and sometimes they get jammed in tabulators, and and that happens. Um, now with hand sanitizer, people are like dousing their hands, and it's making the ballots wet, and then they get jammed, and um, and so we've really tried to sort of normalize those kinds of things so that on election day, when that happens, hopefully it won't be a story about this catastrophe that is happening. But um, Claire, to your point, you know, it's it's going to happen because we can't always get people to engage with this sort of uh, pre-bunking of information. Yeah, and I mean, it feels like we're in a new cycle. I mean, we had a debate the two weeks ago or a week ago, I don't even know what time is anymore, to be honest. <laughs> um, but we had a debate where in the debate you saw uh, the president talk about, uh, you know, there were ballots in a trash can. And when you kind of hear the story of it, it's like, oh, this seems like a much more common occurrence. And it's just a simple thing where, oh, this thing happened and then immediately election officials were called and the thing was taken care of. But if we're not putting those stories out there and normalizing the process, it becomes such an easy thing to sort of 
gin people up and weaponize uh, in a way that winds up creating a, a whole paranoia and skepticism around a, what is a, just a sort of common election process. Yeah, and, and I think at the time, I mean, you know, soon thereafter, I think there were uh, news stories that sort of debunked, uh, you know, the initial, I think the, these were like the Pennsylvania discarded ballots, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, the, the more, um, uh, you know, the more sort of emotionally, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, significant news, uh, which was the false one, uh, got spread much, much more than sort of the correction afterwards. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, staying with you for a minute, uh, Jeff, just in thinking about what we're going through in this moment with 2020, it, it feels like so much of the news in 2016 was this idea of foreign interference. Uh, and I'm curious, are there things that we learned about foreign interference from 2016? And do you see 2020 that we will be repeating some of the same kind, we'll have a repeat of some of the same kind of things? Right. Um, well, I think, I, I definitely think we're dealing with it much better uh, in 2020 um, on various fronts, right? Um, I mean, you know, um, in 2016 that, you know, there were just some just incredibly sort of obvious and, and uh, you know, crazy things in hindsight, right? Like why were, you know, Russian, uh, uh, you know, uh, the IRA buying ads on Facebook using Russian currency, you know, political ads, um, it's, you know, um, so in 2020, I think, you know, we've done a lot better job of sort of figuring out where the foreign disinformation is coming from, right? IRA operations have been exposed, you know, multiple times uh, this year and last year. Um, and, you know, it's almost at the point where, you know, I think we're journalists and, and researchers are getting quite good at it and sort of, you know, deconstructing uh, the campaigns and how they worked, you know, who was involved, um, you know, how, how different actors got paid, you know, um, uh, who who were <laughs> who was behind it and who are unwitting actors, right? I, I think um, one good example is that that peace data uh, story that uh, folks may have seen, where you know Russians recruited uh, the Russian IRA recruited uh, you know uh, freelance writers from across the internet to you know audience build for this website called Peace Data, uh, and um, you know so I think th there's a there's a lot more attention on sort of that type of foreign disinformation. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's positive. Um, but I also think that uh, there's a, a risk of sort of over indexing on, you know, what, what has happened before. Um, and 2020 is going to be a little bit different, right? I think there's, you know, obviously there's COVID, um, there's going to be sort of mail-in ballots and we, we're not too sure if we'll know the results of the election on election night, right? Um, and so, you know, I think it'll look a little bit different this year if it happens. And I think, you know, the good thing is I think people have sort of given a lot of thought and, and sort of how to respond um, in case, uh, you know, uh, uh, foreign interference happens this year, right? And I, I think there's, yeah. there's, there's a multitude of ways that it could happen, uh, but I think people are aware and um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's good, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's good progress. Yeah. Well, well, thinking about the ways that, uh, you know, it could happen, are there things that you've seen as far as how tactics and techniques may be changing? Is it as simple as like, okay, this time it's not Pizza Gate, it's Cinnabon Gate. Like, are there, <laughs> like, is it just that simple? Like, just change the location, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so, so Pizza Gate has, has sort of morphed, right? I mean, in, in many ways, Q, QAnon is very much sort of a derivative of, of Pizzagate, right? These, you know, child abuse uh, conspiracies and, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Trump administration has this, you know, is a secret, has is, is sort of like secretly, <laughs> you know, fighting, uh, uh, you know, politicians uh, who are trafficking in child abuse. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it'll look similar, right? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it's, 
maybe in some ways you could say like the damage has been done a little bit, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, as a society, I think we're much more aware of these issues. Um, uh, there are new tactics, right? As, as you know, the IRA has found it more difficult to, you know, spread their views online. They've started, you know, for example, recruiting, you know, people, uh, unwitting third party actors online. Uh, you know, we've seen multiple instances of that to, to sort of write their articles for them. Um, so yeah, the tactics are changing, um, right now, uh, for the moment, it doesn't seem like, you know, there's, uh, we, <laughs> there, there hasn't been an event where people are like, oh my God, you know, this really, uh, changed the course of the conversation. Um, but, uh, we'll see. I, I think that the biggest risk right now is still sort of the, the, the hacking and the leaking. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, I think that that's, um, you know, uh, cybersecurity, I think, is a really uh, important issue. And we're aware that, you know, um, campaigns, um, you know, elections, administrators um, uh, sort of all have these vulnerabilities. And um, it just takes, uh, you know, a well-timed uh, hack, uh, you know, to take election systems down on election day or something like that. Um, so I, I think it's something to keep track of. Well, um, if I can jump in really quickly, um, just sort of, I want to clarify though that um, it, you know, a, a compromise of a voter registration database would disrupt election day, but it would not prevent anyone from voting. It would not compromise vote tallies. It would not compromise tabulation. It would not compromise the results. Um, so it's an important thing to remember also um, when you're sort of talking about it, because uh, for the most part, I, you know, Jeff, agree with uh, what you were saying, but I do want to be really clear for the audience that, um, you know, there there are ways that um, bad actors could disrupt election day, but election officials are um, among the most type A people you will ever meet um, and have been doing contingency planning for all variety of scenarios for years and years. Um, and cybersecurity and cyber disruptions and cyber threats have have since 2016 become a much uh, larger part of that contingency planning. And so um, if there were to be some kind of disruption, there's plan B, there's plan C, there's plan D, on and on and on and on, um, so that voting can go on. Well, and with that in mind, Amy, what are local governments, election officials doing to safeguard elections from foreign interference? and? I'm asking that question uh, on behalf of a foreign friend who's looking to disrupt <laughs> elections. Um, well, so the, specifics, as specific as you can get so that they know back doors. I'll, yeah, I'll draw a map and I'll circle it. Excellent. Um, so the first of all, the thing to remember is that interference is both foreign and domestic. And so for election officials, it's both. And on the front end, we're not asking like, excuse me, is this from, uh, you know, Russia or is this from, you know, Connecticut? We are just very focused on addressing uh, bad information that's out there. Um, so specifically with respect to um, misinformation and disinformation, um, I think a lot of the sort of pre-bunking that we talked about previous, previously um, is a big part of that component. Um, but you're also going to see, I think, on election day, um, state and local election officials doing more regular briefings with the media and sort of putting more uh, information out there proactively. Um, I'll also note that um, elections are a, a pretty transparent process. Um, so uh, logic and accuracy testing, which happens before every single election on voting equipment in every jurisdiction in the country, um, that's typically a public event. Right. And now that, you know, we're in COVID times and we can't all be together, um, a lot of that is moving online uh, so that voters can see the process and see what's really happening. And that's the same with, um, you know, ballot tabulation and canvassing, moving those things online so that more people have access to them brings more transparency. And when there's more transparency, it makes people less susceptible to this kind of in, uh, interference. Claire, I want to go to you with something. Um, you mentioned it earlier that uh, Black and Latinx communities are targeted at a, at a disproportionate rate 
with this kind of misinformation. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. What does that look like? Or is it, you know, as we're sort of having a conversation about foreign actors, is it primarily more from foreign actors? Is it something that's happening more domestically? I just wonder if you could uh, sort of talk about that because it, it feels like an interesting thing, why these particular communities are being targeted in the ways that they are. Yeah, I mean, I think when, I mean, I did America, you can tell from my accent, I'm not from Brooklyn, but when you, I know it's a shocker. But if, if I was to, you know, think about America and to think about what issues I could really exacerbate, race is always going to be one of those issues that you can have a huge effect very quickly. So there yes. have been, um, <laughs> there, there were amazing activists back in 2014, women of color, black women who were like, hey, they had this hashtag called your slip is showing as a way to call out. They were finding Russian accounts people pretending to be black and basically saying, your slip is showing as if to be like, I can tell that you're not black, like get out of here type thing. And they were screaming from the rooftops and nobody was listening, surprise, surprise. Um, and so you know, now there's a real recognition of what has been happening for, for a long period of time. But if it's domestic or foreign, actually targeting communities and you know taking advantage of those divisions you know the, the the example we showed there from twitter trying to say i was democrat i'm going to republican you know using race there in a way like weaponizing race because it is already uh, something in this country that is a, obviously um such a fissure so that, i mean it's it's I think we need to have a recognition that it's happening. We need to think strategically about how to work with those communities to say, how can we build trust in those communities? So for the moment, we do, I know we're talking about election misinformation, but there's a huge amount of vaccine misinformation going on. And quite rightly, people in black communities are like, I tell you what, we have not been treated fairly by health, you know, health authorities and institutions for a long time. Um, and there's real concern in those communities. This is not gonna be solved by people in creative agencies creating fun gifts and memes about how you should trust vaccines. This needs to be working with communities to say, how do we build trust around these issues in a way that's authentic? Because I think that that's the challenge here. That's um, we haven't necessarily worked with communities on these issues. There's been a very top down approach um, and we need to have a real understanding of why these communities are being targeted, what tactics are being used against them and how to counter them. Um, and I, I think those conversations are only just starting, unfortunately. Sounds like what you're saying is if we can fix racism, then <laughs> we will not have this big misinformation problem. People won't be targeting us anymore. Um, that's easy. We can do that in a weekend. <laughs> uh, with that, though, I, I just I, I want to stay with you, Claire, for a second. There's a question from Catherine, uh, and it, it's I, I think a very good question that kind of speaks to a lot of this stuff, which is how do you combat this information in an age where people increasingly can't seem to agree on basic facts? I mean, I joke about racism, but you have, you know, just even something like that. There are people who are like, oh, things aren't that bad in this country. And people are saying, are you watching the same news I am or reading the same paper I am? And so I guess, yeah, when people can't agree on basic facts, how do you effectively even combat this? It's not easy. I mean, if, I, if I'm a bad actor and I'm trying to bring down a democracy, I'm going to target those pillars of democracy. So I'm going to target the electoral system. I'm going to target the media. I'm going to target higher education. Um, and what that means is you're trying to undermine those institutions that previously used to be the institutions that we turned to for facts. And as again, we've seen with COVID, there has been a deliberate attempt to undermine the CDC, undermine Dr. Fauci, as a strategy so that people can't agree on the facts. The other thing we've seen with COVID is that what do you do when there isn't even consensus around facts? So on COVID, there is an agreement still on things like, is it airborne, should people be wearing masks, all that craziness. So there's a problem here that people are turning away from expertise, they're turning away from institutions that they would previously turn to. And so when we think about facts, that's the challenge. But I would also say those of us who work in the quality information space, have this love affair with facts as if there's clarity around facts. And sometimes there is, the, the world is definitely round, but there are other facts that are contested. I mean, your point to race, you know, the amazing work on the 1619 project, that itself has become a contested, was that the year that we should, you know, all of those things. So this, I think we sometimes feel like more facts are gonna be the answer without recognizing that people are making sense of information and they themselves are 
thinking about this and contesting it. And that's what makes it so hard. And so we can't say, just send in the fact checkers. We need to understand how people are making sense of the world around them. And that is complex. Um, and it's not aided by the fact that the institutions that we used to turn to are no longer trusted. Yeah. Um, so, depressing answer. <laughs> I, yes, my imaginary aunt is disappointed. She's logging off of Facebook right now. Well, that's uh, what we want her to do. <laughs> oh, oh, well then, never mind. She's logging back on. She's logging back on and she's playing Farmville. She's the last person still playing Farmville. Um, thinking about that, what can everyday people like my imaginary aunt, uh, but also like the people who are watching this discussion right now, uh, what can they do to battle misinformation, disinformation when they see it circulating online? I mean, for election, uh, misinformation going going to your state election officials, um, going to your local election officials, and participating in the process. Right. So serving as an election worker gives you a view into the process by which you know the the polling location is secured and the chain of custody and things like that. Um, observing the process where you can. So um, election officials, especially at the local level, have been you know, making uh, logic and accuracy testing, which I mentioned before, uh, available for public viewing for years. And the complaint, uh, even in, you know, 2018 and, and this year, uh, is that no one is watching. You know, we're making this available to you so you can see how the process works, so that you can learn how it works, um, and so you can feel more confident in it, in it and no one is, is taking advantage of it. Um, and so going to, going to those trusted sources is really, uh, really, really important and understanding um, at its base how the process works. Election results on election night have never been official, ever. They are always unofficial. They are um, data from uh, media outlets that are used to call races, but those are not uh, official election results. It is totally normal for um, state and local election officials to spend the next several days or weeks uh, counting ballots, uh, reviewing uh, provisional ballots, making sure that they're eligible to be counted, uh, counting military and overseas voters that often, uh, ballots that often have different deadlines. This is totally normal. Um, and so really investing a little bit of time on the front end to understand some of the basics of how the election process works in your state uh, will sort of help you in the long run. All right. It sounds like what you're saying is if I want this democracy to work for me, I have to actually work. That's like, yeah, that's a little bit <laughs> boring. Um, we've got time for one last question. Uh, we have a question from Sebastian, who grew up in old Palo Alto, uh, not this new Palo Alto. Uh, but Sebastian now goes to Berkeley. Way to brag, Sebastian. Um, <laughs> And Sebastian asks, isn't the bigger worry that we're allowing our technology companies, Facebook, Google, YouTube, to become the regulators and arbiters of truth? And I throw that to all of you. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, we don't have to, right? I, mean, I think we're in this new media environment that, you know, I think media literacy really um, can really help combat a lot of that. I think, you know, obviously the tech companies have, um, have a lot to do in terms of uh, improving that environment, and there's you know a lot we could do uh, there as well. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think um, it's it's a period of adjustment for people, right? And so I think um, hopefully you know we'll get to a place where where you know people can be can sort of understand how the information gets to them and and sort of why you know certain uh, information rises to the top and and with that understanding sort of. Uh, you know, combat misinformation on a personal level. Um, but I think, you know, with the companies, I think there's definitely more that could be done to, you know, have them take more responsibility for uh, how these systems continue to engage people and, and uh, you know, spread uh, bad information. Yeah, and I, I mean, I just to say, we don't want uh, very large corporations with no oversight to be the arbiters of truth. But I think at the same time, we did live in a world where we had gatekeepers, we had you know, a trusted media environment where you knew who you were tuning into at 6 p.m. We went from that to the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. And I think we have to recognize that 
what we want is somewhere in between. And that means that we need more context. So on Facebook, when everything looks the same, to your point, Wyatt, about it would be very easy for me to mock up something that looks like a state and election website right now, share it on Facebook, and it would most people would just see the name and just be like, oh, that looks official. I mean, that's crazy because as humans, we look for heuristics, these mental shortcuts to help us make sense. To your point, Wyatt, about labels, we need much, much more context. So it's less about Facebook telling me if it's true or not. But Facebook should give me a lot more information about the fact that the website was set up a day ago in upstate New York, you know, all of that stuff. So we can make those kind of decisions ourselves. And I think the last thing I'd say is, you know, their algorithms dictate what we see. There's quality information that they could push up, but then there's the misinformation that they could push down. And there's two different parts of that. And I would like them to see pushing up a lot more of quality information from trusted news sources by ProPublica. And I don't want them to recommend conspiracy content please that's not the kind of like waters i want to wade in if i want to go and find conspiracy content on the internet i can go and find it but i don't want it shoved in my face without me even asking and so i think there's so much to this that we're working through and they're still whatever they're teenagers aren't they these these companies but unfortunately as they struggle through their teenage years society is being damaged so i just wish they'd go and sit in their bedroom quietly <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've worked, uh, election officials and, and members across the election uh, community have worked really hard with um, the platforms, both Facebook, Google, YouTube, and others not listed here, so that some of the information that they are pushing to you um, is coming directly from trusted sources. Obviously, we can't uh, control sort of the other information that they're showing, um, but, you know, working with Facebook, for example, to link directly to state election websites uh, for voter registration content, uh, linking, uh, pardon me, having Google do the same um, for that information proactively so that some of that proactive uh, information that they are pushing at us is coming from trusted sources and that it's not all, you know, coming from Wyatt's aunt. Again, why are we attacking this <laughs> aunt of mine, this unnamed Here. imaginary aunt? We, you know, we still need to get to the dirt that Claire uh, sort of tiptoed around of like, what is this media organization that's sitting on a sitting on a great story about uh, sticky ballots? Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing my guess was going to be it's Boys Life magazine, uh, the magazine for Boy Scouts. Uh, but that's that was just my guess. Um, at the end of the day, though, I want to thank all three of you. Uh, for taking the time, Amy Cohen, Claire Wardle, Jeff Cow. Thank you uh, for talking to all of us. Thank you to all of you who watched, and hopefully uh, this was very helpful. I, I learned a lot in this discussion, and I, I just want to throw if there are any just kind of last very quick things any of you uh, want to say, whether to my aunt or just to the viewers, I, I want to give you that opportunity uh, right now before we go but you all have to say it at the exact same time. <laughs> I would just say, don't wait. Um, if, you, uh, if your state voter registration deadline hasn't passed, register to vote, check your registration. Uh, if you need to apply for an absentee ballot, do it early, return your ballot early, make a plan to vote early. Don't leave this till the last minute um, and uh, get excited to uh, participate. And be patient, it seems like. that's. I feel like that's maybe the other thing. If, if anything, hopefully, as horrible as this pandemic has been, hopefully it gives us a better idea of like learning to be patient, <laughs> that we don't need our news via Twitter immediately. We don't need our election decided at 11.59 on Tuesday that we should be able to wait for the facts. Um, but thank you all for uh, taking the time today. Uh, to all of you, stay safe. To all of you watching, stay safe. Uh, yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.